Hello there. Well, I don't have any classes scheduled right now, and I don't have any privates scheduled right now, so I thought I'd do some multitasking and train both you and my dog at the same time. I thought it would be a really good idea to explain how the cue collar works. First of all, it's a passive correction, so it's not dependent on physical strength. It is not dependent on you. It is dependent on the dog. The dog becomes responsible for his own correction. That's the difference between active and passive. You have nothing really to do with the beginning use of the cue collar. So the cue collar comes in, you know, six colors. We still do have purple, but we don't promote that because when the purple are gone, I believe that we won't be ordering any more purple. So if you want purple, order right away. Comes in three sizes. The large, the medium, and the small. All right, when fitting the collar, you want to make sure that it's not digging into the dog's neck. So there has to be some slack in there so that when you, when you put it on, you have to be able to get a finger underneath there without it hurting you. Now, you won't have to have the collar probably quite as tight as you would for a dog that slides out of his collar, like those dogs with pencil heads. All right, because this is going to catch. Don't you steal my collar, you horrible dog. Okay. So it's got to be not only some space in there, but you need to have that collar directly opposite this ring, or the bone directly opposite this ring, so that when you attach a lead and you pull on it, you're, you're pulling away from the dog. As we get into the training, farther into it, you can actually step on the line and the pressure will be on the back of the dog's neck and the dog will go into a down very easily without fighting and without you doing a lot of gyrations. You need to be able to have verbal control. Izzy, hey, that's mine. Thank you. Good. She know, hey, that is mine. She's normally tied with a chain. <laughs> so it's, we don't normally have the option. Anyway, so when you have both collars fitted the same way, both collars or both cue bones directly opposite, that means when the dog is tied and when you pull it, you get that nice connection. And then release. To use it, you make sure there's always slack in the line. If it's already tight, then it's just a constant correction. It's just like catching a fish. Boom. Now, the large and the medium, the posts on them are a little bit longer. The large bones are used on dogs with a lot of attitude. Now, that does not mean necessarily size. This would have been way too much correction for my deer hound. He was a very sensitive dog. Now that doesn't mean I didn't use it on him if he wanted to go chase the cats in the barn. But um, it does mean that he wasn't a dog that habitually needed a big collar. So that's for a lot of attitude. The more space they cover, the more it deals with. So you can see this covers a lot more space on my arm than where it went here. This. Which this, by the way, is what I used on him. He had no problem with that. Show dogs, this is what I use on them. All right. The medium, same size posts as the large, but a little smaller surface area. So therefore, a little less memorable. One would think that a small dog would always use a small one. No, I use these on Jack Russells that come in with a lot of um, determination to chase other dogs, etc., etc., etc. Okay, a lot of the larger dogs end up eventually using a medium one, but that's truly however they train. The small ones are the least correction of all. Okay. Now, the posts on these are 
taken down shorter so that it's much less of a correction. This is appropriate for puppies. This is appropriate for very soft dogs. That's done. When I do the assessment of the dog, that's when I make that decision. So when you're doing an assessment, it's how much effort it takes to get that dog to change. Now how it works is this. When we're thinking about training in a natural way that makes sense to the dog, not to us, to the dog, the, it has to make sense to the dog or he isn't going to know what to do. So all of the coaxing and bribing and pleading and begging and prevention doesn't teach the dog anything. That makes you, you responsible, not the dog. That's dangerous. The dog needs to understand absolutely clear and firm limits and boundaries. Absolutely clear and firm expectations. But this is as if you hired a foreign-speaking employee. So he can do the job. In his own country, he was a doctor. However, in your home, he doesn't speak the same language you do. So there's a problem with communication, not training. When we think about a dog, a, a wolf was born trained. They didn't need us to tell them what to do. A dog is related to a wolf, therefore... He understands how to sit, lie down, stand, the day he's born. He doesn't need you to teach him to sit. So if it takes you six weeks to teach him to sit, <laughs> you got a real problem. Dog's been sitting since he was two weeks old. He's been laying down since he was born. He's been standing since two weeks. Our job is to communicate. Oh, and then there's you. Now, there's three natural corrections that a mother dog can do with a puppy, or will do with a puppy. She does not choke the puppy. She does not bat him upside the head. She does not put a gate up and prevent him. She teaches him what she expects, age appropriate. So if she was eating or chewing on a bone and that puppy came up to take it away, she would in dog language say, back off. If the puppy was being rude and obnoxious, she would, in a dog way, say subtle. If she wanted that puppy to come with her, she would let that puppy understand he was to come with me. Now we can't speak dog. Dog doesn't speak human, English, or whatever language. So it's a matter of translation into a way so that there's a common understanding. So we're going to use English words to go with dog behaviors. So because the dog doesn't understand English, we can't give him instruction. It's like if someone you wanted to go to the bathroom and you're trying to direct them, but they don't speak the same language, you might take them by the arm and guide them. Well, that's exactly what it takes not just correct them for peeing on the floor, which they've done every day of their life until they came into your home. Now you're mad at them for doing, the, so, doing something they've done their whole life. How does the dog understand that? They don't. Then they begin to fear you. On the other hand, if you can't get them to comply, they've won the confrontation. They laugh at you, especially the terriers. So there has to be a way, a kind way, a fair way, a firm way, a consistent way to correct bad behavior without it becoming fear of making a decision. Yeah, 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 you awful little dog. All right. So there's three natural corrections a mother dog would do. A growl. Now, when we do it, the growl is both the command and the praise. Easy. Good easy. Not easy. How patronizing does that sound? Close your eyes and have somebody say it to you. Easy. That dog will just laugh at you. 
You aren't any kind of a leader if you talk to your employees that way. Easy. Good easy. Yeah, yeah, you awful dog. The next way is a nip. A nip is one cue collar on the dog and you're holding it. Now, in a passive training style, you tie the dog. So the dog corrects himself. So if in fact this is the dog, all right, woof, 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 I'm not coordinating, I'll do this end. <laughs> okay, now I can bark. All right, so woof, woof, woof. All right, so if I pull, it's like stepping on a stone in your shoe. Keep pulling, it doesn't get any softer. The dog will back off from it. Back away from pressure. So by just simply tying the dog, the dog learns that he can avoid the correction totally just by listening to your voice. So if the dog starts to chase people, easy. Oh, maybe I will. If he starts to go after the vacuum cleaner, easy. He backs off the pressure. Pretty soon he's laying there watching the vacuum go by instead of chasing it. Company coming in. When children were little, you put them in a swing. They watched people come in and out. Somehow it makes sense to turn a puppy loose and let them chase everybody that comes through the door. Uh, no. We put children in a swing or a playpen because we wanted them to make good decisions, not have to have us chase after them. So one collar allows you a nip. For major crimes, a nip is like one of those $5 speeding tickets. Until you got one of them $500 babies, you really don't know what a speeding ticket is. Where'd it go? Here we go. That's when we put two collars on the dog. So, when one collar is on, tied to something, and you have the other collar with a lead, and you pull those collars this way, why, that would look just like teeth, wouldn't it? Now, many people look at this and say, oh, that's a pinch collar. No, it's not. A pinch collar would be like the pack leader taking down a belligerent pack member. When that pinch collar grabs around the neck, it is telling that dog, if you pull on this lead, I'll rip your throat out. This is the correction that a mother dog would do with a baby. Bite them. Not a threat. You little thief. Oh yeah, you don't want anything within reach. Oh, oh, oh. look at you horrible dog. Now you can see that that cute collar is not hurting her. She's not the least bit intimidated by that. This is a three-month-old puppy. And what she's doing is, first of all, learning respect for the lead. Because she's respectful of the limits of the lead, in, I can walk her with a long line and she stays right with me, never pulls on the lead. So instead of locking her in a crate where she has to wake me up in the middle of the night, She's tied just like this. Now, this is not where she's tied, so she's not used to this crate pan or the tray. But this is a really good option if you've got a lot of dog equipment or even if you have a, a large um, entry rug that's got rubber backing on it. You lay that out, put some papers on there, keep the crate clean, but keep some of the um, paper... You know, let it have a little bit of smell to it. Now, what happens is you're teaching the puppy to keep her crate clean without you getting up in the middle of the night. This puppy sleeps all night long. So if she can't hold it, she will get up and use the papers. If she sleeps all night, she wakes up about 6.30, 7 o'clock in the morning, 
and she's quite evil. As your puppy gets into teething stages, which she's not quite into yet, you can put a light chain on there. Make sure it's got a swivel. You don't use any active toys, no ball, no no nothing that they could, that rolls away, because then you become a retriever. You put things there that she can play with that are positive. That little bone's got peanut butter in it if she wants to chew on that. She's got toys that she can chew on, tug with, play with. This teaches them to entertain themselves. And people can walk in and out of the room. Um, you can have company. You can eat dinner. And guess where she's at? I can sit right here and have a cup of coffee. And guess who's not invited? So in our program, we start all dogs like a service dog. This is one of the biggies teaching these puppies to be respectful of the lead. Now, that's a little over, about a week over three months old. Other than chewing my lead, and she's ready for a change, she's almost teething. But other than that, what else could you ask from a young puppy? Now, as a service dog, and she will be, she'll be a hearing or a medical alert dog. This is gonna be a wonderful little dog, bright, happy, never had a serious correction in her life. She believes the world is positive. She trusts people. She's not learning to be rude. And within two days, are you chewing my lead that much? She is, isn't she? That means you have to get them. You little horrible dog. You are a horrible little dog. Anybody ever mention that to you? Yes. Now I have in there a, a round disc weight so that it she can sleep on this cover. It's actually got a pad underneath it and it's got a rug on top of it. She can't roll it out. She can't move the crate. Oh, yeah, why don't you chew on the bone? She's not into anything. This pan isn't quite big enough for her. Hey, you. That's a busy, busy monkey shiner. Good potty. Oh, what a good potty. Your main goal is to keep the crate clean. Good potty, Sizzy. That's what monkey shinos do. Come here. I know, you're very cute. Now, she's got two collars on. She's never been, we've not used two colors yet. She's a little young. So for the most part, she's sentenced to being tied to her crate until she's up being petted. She does get to go outside when it's time, but this puppy's never been played with roughly or handled improperly in any way. Nobody teases her, nobody does anything. The world goes on around her, she watches and learns. For that reason, hi. That's a dizzy. Your relationship with your dog ends up to be all positive. You know what? I think that's what most people want. I think so. I know. Are you cute? Yeah. And by the way, this is half Lakeland. <laughs> so, ye Lakeland owners. Okay. Um, anyway, when you order the Q Collar packet, it has all of the instructions about training. We're in the process of updating all of that, but in the meantime, everything's there. In the meantime, you're free to check out Quonset Kennels Incorporated, both website and Facebook page. There's a lot of training information. There's many, many videos, um, and we're going to expand on those. We are going to have videos available uh, for particular problems, such as aggressive, aggressive large dogs or, you know, separation anxiety and things like that. So we will be having those things as we go along. But I thought it was very important to get this information out there for you. Um, I hope it's helpful. If you have any questions, just write to me.
Thanks a lot.